Across the world, millions have worn pink ribbons and donated billions of dollars, hoping to cure breast cancer. But what's actually being achieved? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. The pink ribbon has become a globally recognized symbol of the fight against breast cancer. And once again, October was deemed a month of awareness for a disease that claims the lives of tens of thousands of women worldwide each year. There's little doubt that many with cancer have found strength in the knowledge that they're not alone as a result of such campaigns. An estimated $6 billion is raised annually. Yet survival rates for those diagnosed have not improved dramatically over the last 20 years. And some have questioned whether, rather than the race for a cure, it's those marketing pink-branded products from Kentucky Fried Chicken to the National Football League that are the main financial beneficiaries of awareness campaigns. The role of the Susan G. Komen Foundation has come under particular scrutiny. The charity owns stock in pharmaceutical companies and businesses like General Electric, who make mammogram machines. Its sponsors include companies that produce products that have been linked to cancer. Critics question whether, as a result, an organization viewed by many as a preeminent authority on breast cancer is in fact helping stifle much-needed debate and research on pinpointing the causes of the disease and its most effective treatment. So what impact are breast cancer awareness campaigns having? To discuss this, I'm joined from San Francisco by Karina Jagger, Executive Director of Breast Cancer Action. From New York, Elaine Shatner is with us. She's a doctor who ran a cancer immunology research lab and is a breast cancer survivor herself. And in the studio, Kim Patton. She works for the Foundation Center, an organization that trains charities and nonprofit groups. Dr. Shatner, it might not be a bad idea to begin by contextualizing all of this, um, perhaps how far we've come in 20 or 30 years in, in how um, those with breast cancer uh, are viewed and treated. Well, uh, th first, thank you for having me. I think this is an important conversation. Um, I think women with breast cancer now feel much more welcome and comfortable uh, not just in doctor's offices, but talking openly with their families, with their friends, and in their communities. Uh, and that helps them to get the support that they need. Uh, Karina Jagger, some of the reports that I've read suggest, though, that um, it was a matter of sort of women's health movements and feminism and, and, uh, and um, forces like that, which, which transformed the way uh, that doctors were, in fact, treating, uh, treating women um, the, the sort of um, treatments they were suggesting, again, the, again, the, the sort of the sense of stigma that was involved with breast cancer once. Yes. Breast Cancer Action was founded 22 years ago by a group of women living with and dying from breast cancer. And there is no question that just a short time ago, 30 years ago, women were suffering largely in silence. So this grassroots movement of activists to really bring breast cancer out of the closet was very important in destigmatizing the disease, as well as bringing much needed resources to the disease. Unfortunately today, that awareness is stopping us from actually moving in the directions that we need to move to fully address and end this epidemic. In the last 30 years, despite the billions, and it is billions with a B, that is raised in the name of and spent on breast cancer, we simply are not seeing a reduction in incidence, nor are we seeing improvements in the mortality for women diagnosed with the disease. But where does the problem lie? I would argue that this focus on awareness is really distracting us from the changes we need. We need strong regulation that protects public health, that follows a precautionary principle based on existing scientific evidence about toxins and chemicals which are contributing to an increased risk of the disease. You would be amazed to realize that today, in 2012, 30 years after the sort of uh, push for more awareness and resources for breast cancer, we still can't explain more than half of all breast cancers. 
if you look at everything we know about breast cancer, that's the hereditary risks, it's lifestyle factors, everything we know put together explains no more than 30 to 50% of all breast cancers. We have a long way to go in understanding the disease, and we have a long way to go in terms of stopping this epidemic. Kim Patton, I mean, this is where the sort of approaches chosen by some of the leading breast cancer uh, organizations like Susan G. Komen yes. uh, come in. Um, when diagnosed, the great uh, journalist Barbara Ehrenreich wrote about her experiences, um, and she sort of chafed at how she was. She felt she was being almost immediately infantilized. And, and this wasn't the empowerment then of the women's health movement that 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 that, that, that changed treatment and attitudes. This was actually yeah. almost getting back to the opposite then of of suddenly being um, you know treated treated like a girl. She actually she famously said, you know, men with prostate cancer aren't given matchbox cars, but suddenly yeah. she was being presented with, with teddy bears. Is that the starting point then, that, that this whole, the whole attitude isn't, isn't, it's all being framed correctly? Well, I think that raising awareness was important, like some of the panelists said, and I think we've done that. I think we've raised the issue to the forefront where it used to be behind some of the male issues. Now it's, you know, an issue on the forefront, and perhaps we do need to start redirecting the money toward, you know, finding a cure, research, and things that maybe hadn't been focused on in the past. But, but Dr. Shatner, I mean, the argument is, though, um, in the Komen organization, in trying to give patients such a positive outlook, they're sort of, they're discouraging anger and critical judgment and questioning about how they po probably got the disease in the first place. That seemed too negative. Uh, well, first, I'm not here to defend the Komen organization. I'm not a particular uh, supporter of that group. Um, the, p the point of the article that, I, that was published le a few days ago was that the anger that's coming out against Pink is something which I find uh, a distraction. And I think that I agree with the Breast Cancer Action Group in that the, the, we're distracted from the problem. Right. That the environment is a serious issue, um, and and that I agree. Also, I'm a fan of Barbara Ehrenreich's work. I think the whole pink tchotchkes and and uh, other objects that are sold tend to demean women and infan infantilize people who have adults who have illness, a serious illness. But. But I just think that all the infighting among the organizations is counterproductive. Right. Uh, Karina Jagger, I mean, that, that is another, another point. I mean, there's, there's a lot of work to do, but at the very least, the Komen Foundation and other organizations do uh, give strength to those with cancer. Again, they, they, they realize, people realize they're not alone. Well, I think it depends on who you are. I think what we see with Komen's supporters is that Komen is very good at galvanizing and mobilizing women and giving them a sense of community. That said, they're pushing a particular narrative that excludes many other women. Some of the women that have already been referenced to want to know more about why they got the disease in the first place. It's been said many times that women with metastatic disease who are dying of breast cancer feel marginalized and excluded. They're the elephant in the room. They're who nobody wants to be in this narrative of cheerful fighter survivor who can conquer this disease. Um, what I argue is, you know, in essence, Komen has clout. And Komen is, is in a unique position to take their brand and push their partners who say they care about breast cancer to take those steps to make sure their products and services are safe. So for example, if Komen is going to take a million dollars from a company, I would like to see Komen pushing that company to, to ensure that those products and services aren't in fact contributing to an increased risk of the disease. That's one area, I think. But, uh, Karina, there, there's a lot of areas where we can. Well, I agree excuse completely. Me. I mean. Yeah, but I, I suppose the question Sorry. is, um, uh, Dr. Shatner, there, I mean, is it not a matter of I, infighting, but actually of saying, hang on, this group is in fact preventing a proper discourse about, uh, uh, about the disease and in fact acting as a smokescreen for those who may be the causes of the disease? Yeah. Well, I think, again, I, I wasn't prepared to speak about Komen, but I do, I do think in general that the so-called pink agencies, in my experience at least in New York City, and in Washington, at every event I've ever attended, 
the women with advanced disease are welcome. They're, they're treated usually as heroes. Uh, they're the reason why many of the volunteers are working as they do. Um, I know I've heard the argument about the pink elephant in the room, and it can be disconcerting. I mean, I, I sat down last year with a woman who told me that her disease recurred after 15 years, you know, and it's scary if, if you've had, if you think you're a survivor in the traditional sense and that you're, you've beaten the disease, which is language I don't espouse, and then you're confronted with someone who has, you know, is living what you're afraid of. But I don't think any of these agencies are marginalizing those women or pushing them aside. Quite the opposite. I think Coleman is trying now to do more work for women with metastatic disease. And I know certainly the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, which also uses a pink ribbon in its uh, campaigns. It's all about research and developing drugs for uh, advanced disease. Well, we'll, so we'll look I into that, that in, in a second. I'm uh, not sure it's true what you're saying. Uh, Kim Patton, I mean, as someone who helps um, those set up yes. NGOs, what do you make of, 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 of the work of organizations like Coma? Well, I think there are many organizations working in this field. There's the large national ones that everybody sort of sees. A lot of the corporations like to work with those because they have a lot of visibility. But there are a lot of nonprofits working on the grassroots level, too. So I think there's a wide range but of spectrum doesn't Coleman of doesn't tend to sue uh, grassroots organizations who even use the term cure. That can't be terribly helpful. Yeah, <laughs> because of the name, the, yeah. the, the trademark name. Yeah, I mean, they're a big corporate um, giant, a nonprofit, but they're doing good work, too. So I don't think that you can, you know, kind of pit nonprofits against each other in that way. I think there's room for it all for you know brand raising for for raising awareness for prevention for research for helping underserved women who can't get treatment at all so I think there's many shades of pink on the on the pink spectrum uh, Karuna how do you see that relationship then between Komen and more grassroots organizations who are also um, uh, trying to raise awareness and and help those with breast cancer yeah so I think what Komen does is embody some of the issues that are problematic about mainstream breast cancer approaches. And so I think I want to make sure this isn't just specific to Komen. What we're really saying is that there, we've achieved awareness. And what we need to do now is move beyond awareness to really ensuring that we are developing more effective, less toxic treatments that get in the hands of women. We are not seeing enough in terms of treatments that benefit women. As I've said, the mortality rate remains stubbornly high on this disease. We need some innovative research that's independent, that's, that's filling in the gaps that are left by industry, by pharma and biotech, which will only fund certain kinds of research that are patentable and profitable. And so we need the government and other independent funders to fund those gaps that remain in the, in the industry uh, led research agenda. We also need strong regulation that follows a basic precautionary principle to protect public health in light of the information that we have today. We cannot afford to wait for, well, we can't conduct, you know, controlled experiments on human beings exposing them to known toxins. And so we, we're always going to fall short of the gold standard of scientific cause and effect when it comes to environmental links to breast cancer by virtue of the fact that we're not going to experiment on humans in that way. And so we need to follow basic public health precaution and protect public health. Um, I want to see less, uh, uh, really less, uh, this is a bit of an echo, I want to see less of the um, industry influence in the whole regulatory process. Right, well, I mean, that's, that's possibly, probably the most serious charge against some of these organizations then, the, these, these large charities, um, that as a result of the type of sponsors they have, yes. who often use uh, chemicals that have been linked to cancer, that these charities yes. are then actively discouraging discussion and research on um, environmental causes, or potential environmental causes of breast cancer. Is there any actual evidence of that, Karina? Oh, there's a lot of evidence. I think if you look at 
Komen specifically, there have been some investigative journalists who have done some research into Komen's uh, supporters and, and, and don't, corporate donors and their positions on particular chemicals. You know, I note that their own scientific advisor, Eric Weiner, has full, acknowledged in public that DES, which is a synthetic uh, estrogen that was given to women um, several decades ago in order to prevent miscarriage, and those women had an increased risk of vaginal cancers, and, and today in their 50s and 60s, it turns out they also have an increased risk of breast cancer. Well, Komen puts DES along with the chemical BPA, which again has a quite a compelling body of evidence behind it, it puts those on its website along with underwire bras and miscarriage as those things which don't have a, a, a link to an increased risk of breast cancer. And I think that flatly um, doesn't follow the science. Actually, if, if I may uh, make two points uh, about the science. Uh, first, um, yeah. Um, Komen supported and paid for basically a panel of expert scientists uh, uh, put together by the Institute of Medicine on the environmental causes of breast cancer and that report was published in uh, December of 2011. And they pointed to BPA and it quite clearly and, and described the as evidence uh, for that as uh, probably and likely causative, yes, and that was all paid well, for by Komen and the, you know, and and I should also point out just an earlier point about mortality and breast cancer that there's been no progress. I mean, that's not true. Little um, progress. I think very uh, little progress. It's not. No, there's been huge progress, and I say that as an oncologist. You know, in 1950, uh, a woman's chances of dying of breast cancer were just greater than 50-50. Now, if a breast cancer is caught early, the chances are uh, over 90% that she'll die of another cause. And the biggest imp improvement has been since 1975 or 1980. And what, what most oncologists would say is that that progress is due to increased um, detection and earlier detection so that women require uh, lesser surgeries and lesser drugs and also due, to, um, due t to essentially better screening and the combination of the two. If there are more cancers detected and the number of women who die each year is the same or actually slightly lower, that suggests that there's progress over th uh, against the disease. Karina Jago? Yeah, well, there's two things. So on the one hand, I think, um, you know, we've seen that about 40,000 women are dying of the disease consistently for the last two or three decades. And that's, that's too many women who are dying. I think, you know, we can talk about the role of screening and that's its own panel in and of itself. What we know about screening is absolutely, it's the best, mammography is the best tool that we have. It's an important tool and it's a fundamentally limited tool. Uh, and we don't know enough. It misses many breast cancers and it doesn't help us distinguish between the, those breast cancers that do need treating and those which will never become clinically evident and, and, and impact a woman's life. That's an issue around mortality. I want to go back to the issue around the IOM's report that was funded by Komen. Komen did pay a million dollars to the IOM to fund a report on breast cancer in the environment. That report looked and defined the environment so broadly that it included everything that wasn't a, a, a hereditary uh, DNA mutation. That meant that the body was viewed as the environment for the breast and the breast tumor. So that report included factors such as abdominal fat as well as what we think of as traditional environment. Um, the, the conclusions really were fairly weak and they did emphasize lifestyle at the same time that the, that the panelists on the report said, we actually don't know that if a woman follows these recommendations, if she will actually reduce her individual risk or not. Nonetheless, those were the sort of takeaways that were given to the public about this report on breast cancer and the environment. It was all about rehashing the same things that we've been yeah. talking about for a long time, exercise, avoid alcohol, avoid postmenopausal weight gain, breastfeed, those kinds of basic live healthy messages um, that really don't touch on the environment. The report itself did have some nuance in it. It pointed to BPA, and yet if you look at the Komen's website, 
in their list of chemicals or, or their list of, of risk factors that have not been linked to breast cancer, it includes DES, BPA, underwire bras, abortion, and miscarriage as things which are not linked to an increased risk of breast cancer. I would say that doesn't fall, and, and you know, in Silent Spring Institute, which was funded by, by the Komen Foundation at one point, um, has argued that Komen doesn't follow the science that they themselves fund. Very quickly on that report, Dr. Shatton, I mean, wasn't it more of a review of the research that was already out there? Uh, having then just rehashed the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty about these chemicals, it was striking that Komen then didn't say, all right, well, let's spend a few million on really going into BPA or some of these other chemicals which, uh, which, upon which there is a question yeah. mark. <sighs> I would like to see that. I mean, I actually, I support, I think BCA, the Breast Cancer Action, um, has done some of the most important work in pushing the cause of environmental oncology. I mean, I see that as a huge gap in information. And yeah. I mean, the point I was trying to make in the piece that I wrote was that the goals of the different foundation are like a mosaic that work together. I mean, each of our concerns are not identical, but, but are, each each right. matters. So if BCA focuses on the environment, sure they should do that. I mean, I personally hope more people will, will support BCA because we need to understand what it is that we're ingesting and right. drinking and wearing that are causing this. Kim Patton, this. I, there's no argument. And uh, I need to bring Kim Kim back in there. There's so much there to uh, to, to, to cover. Whatever you right. <laughs> what what we're really talking about in a lot of cases is cause related marketing. That's where a corporation will partner with a nonprofit to sort of, you know, market their products as well as, you know, give to a particular cause. And right. so what I tell people at the Foundation Center in our classes related to that is the nonprofit itself does have to sort of be the um, steward of their mission and make sure that the people that and they're partnering with is that don't happening? turn off That's the donors. question. Or are they actually not part in, of a mosaic and complementary, but are actually trying to stifle some of the debate? Though? You have to be very aware of that whenever you partner with a corporation, really thinking about what's their motives and what's your motive and how is this going to really advance yeah. the, the mission of the nonprofit but, but Kim, as opposed to the profits of the corporation. For example, when Komen but, has, a but very I think has a very close... If, if I may... Just very, very quickly though, Komen, for example, has a very close link to AstraZeneca. And then Komen is one of the few cancer, the, the pharmaceutical company, and then Komen is one of the few organizations, cancer organizations, that says, hang on, you know, you can use uh, you know, tamoxifen, you know, their drug, preventatively, mm -hmm. even though they're side effects. Right. How can we trust Komen when they have such a close relationship, both as, uh, both as you know, AstraZeneca being one of their sponsors and indeed Komen having shares in AstraZeneca. Right. I, I mean, uh, there's I that conflict of interest we're worried about. I don't want to speak to Komen specifically, yeah. but I do say that donors now are becoming much more savvy about that kind of stuff than we used to, and that's why we're even sitting here talking about this, because a lot of people that are donating to organizations are looking at what are your relationships with right. these corporations, and is that advancing my values and my beliefs and what I'm giving and my money the danger to there do. is that many others get discredited perhaps because they're yes, because that they're, are doing good practice. they yeah. might be get, getting discredited you can always look at an organization's 990 to get that kind of information to see you know who it is that they're well, that's very important uh, Dr. Shatner I'm sorry you wanted to come in yeah that's all right no I, th I think that it's important that the agencies be transparent that we should know about their relationships with companies Frankly, it would be better if they didn't have relationships with companies. I, I agree. Um, but but I, what's happening, for example, on the BCA site, um, when you're, if the, it says think before you pink, which is very right. reasonable that anyone giving to a charity should know what it's for. And I've had trouble personally, like in Staples, if you ask, you know, t when they say, do you want to give a dollar or buy a pen for breast cancer? First, it's against breast cancer, and then which agency, and they're not sure. That happens all the time, but the bottom line is, if people are doubting about giving uh, to any so-called pink agency, that's going to hurt some of the good ones, uh, independent of Komen, and that concerns me a lot. You know, there's sort of a bleeding effect if you say breast cancer fundraising is bad and there are ties to industry and it's all about making money and you know, people become suspicious of the agencies, which ultimately harms all of our goals and fundraising, f which is needed to support research that is very costly. I mean, the federal government is not going to have more money right. for research in the We're running out of time. Karina Jagger? So those are great points. And I think uh, you know, what we have seen is that over the last year, the public has really 
stepped up and said, we care about breast cancer, and they should. And what they have also said is we recognize that the status quo isn't working, and so the public is starting to ask those harder questions and look beyond the pink ribbon, which I think historically has gotten a pass and has been seen as something that is automatically standing for something good. The pink ribbon is unregulated. Anybody can put it on anything, and they do. It's on handguns and oil rigs, and it's on products which do not donate anything to any breast cancer organization. And so we've developed a list of critical questions for conscious consumers, very much to Elaine's point, to help people make sense of this. All right, we have to leave it there. Marketing. Uh, Karina Jagger, thank you very much. Dr. Elaine Shatner, thank you. Kim Patton, thank you. That's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.